In 2007, a con was unearthed that would stun the music world. We're talking about a hoax of such magnitude, it's almost unimaginable. It was a hoax masterminded by a small-time record producer and his wife from an unremarkable town in Hertfordshire. My main reaction when the fraud really was proved was of total disgust because they let down everybody. This was a fraud born out of passion and ambition, a fraud so clever it left the music establishment questioning everything they thought they knew. It's such a labyrinth. I don't know what's what anymore. In 2003, a new recording star, Joyce Hatto, came to the attention of the leading classical music critics. A recording of her playing Mozart came across my desk and I put it on and I, and I just remember thinking, here was a player of such fluency, um, someone who seemed totally at ease with the technical demands of the music, but also beyond that found an elegance and, and uh, something which went straight to the heart. Industry insiders were astounded. Joyce Hatto had not played in public since her last concert in 1976. She would now be well into her 70s. Whispers on the music grapevine began. It was a behind the scenes sort of process. Aficionados of the, of the piano in particular were immediately fascinated by this and stunned by it. People start saying, well, here's the, the, the greatest secret ever unveiled in the piano world. And now, this woman in her 70s was turning out CDs of virtually every major composer. Anything from Liszt to Godowski to Mozart. The complete Beethoven sonatas, virtually the complete works of Chopin, Rachmaninoff. All the Brahms concertos and the Tchaikovsky concertos and all the Rachmaninoff for unbelievable, really. The reviews were unbelievable. They were unqualified raves. It'd be like someone being able to play midfield, defence, striker and goal, possibly for both teams, <laughs> at the same time. But who was producing and disseminating these musical riches? Curiously, the label Concert Artists had the same address as the house Joyce Hatto shared with her husband, William Barrington Coop, in Royston, Hertfordshire. Barry, as he was known in the industry, had been Hatto's agent and producer since they married in the early 50s. The great influence from the moment they met was Barry. At every stage, he was there promoting her, advising her. I think as a piano coach, he was probably the most important person in her life as well. As a young woman in her 20s, with her producer husband behind her, Joyce's career took off. Barry organized the concerts, the foreign tours, and the cover shots. My husband is a, a very good critic. He has a better idea of sound than myself. He always says exactly what he thinks is right for me or for the music. And so therefore I can trust his opinion. She had some encouraging reviews and very nice things were said about her. Then increasingly, um, people don't say such nice things about her. By the 70s, Joyce's performances had become increasingly erratic. This concert I went to was quite simply the most extraordinary, amazing, strange, weird recital I'd ever attended. Almost from the outset, we realized that we were in for a rough ride. After she'd been playing for a short while, she suddenly collapsed, face down, hands on the piano, unconscious and it, it was a terrible moment. After this particular concert, in 1976, Joyce did not perform in public for the next 25 years. It seems evident that this crisis of confidence resulted in what we might loosely call some sort of breakdown, and she never got over that sufficiently to be able to face the public again. So how was it that after a quarter of a century in the wilderness, Joyce had made such an impressive comeback. Critics were intrigued to meet the couple behind the recordings. He was a rather avuncular gentleman in an old, rather battered tweed jacket. 
bit sort of threadbare, I thought, a bit Oxfam, quite honestly. And Joyce was a small lady in a kind of twin set and pearls and I think very elegantly turned out. And we hit it off straight away. Over lunch, Jeremy Nicholas learned that Joyce had been recording her CDs while suffering from cancer. And they seem to have been recorded in a somewhat unconventional location. Here was a little old lady battling against cancer, going down to the bottom of her garden in Royston, sitting down at her piano, and producing these remarkable performances of virtually the entire piano repertoire. Who wants to disbelieve that? It's the most marvellous, marvellous story. Suddenly, profiles began to appear. Then her performances began to come up on, on Radio 3. Suddenly, she was up there with the best. The Chopin etudes, absolutely mind-blowing. Beethoven Bagatelles were, were amazingly good. And one CD led to another. And I spent some about 500 pounds, probably. At the height of the excitement around Joyce, I say, you know, she was she was out selling most pianists I can think of. Suddenly you have an international audience. People in Japan hear your records. You may never have played there, but they hear your records, and round it goes all over the world. Behind the scenes, Joyce's husband Barry was releasing more and more CDs. Goodness me, loads of emails from Barry about what Joyce was doing in the studio and how she was progressing, how her illness was taking its toll, but she was managing to record this, that and the other. This was a heroic story. This lady who hadn't let adversity beat her and was still honing her craft and still stretching for that ideal. Tragically, in 2006, at the peak of her revival, Joyce Hatto died. Barry described how only days before, Joyce had recorded Beethoven's farewell sonata from her wheelchair. Joyce died at home, only three months before her and Barry's 50th wedding anniversary. The obituaries called her one of the greatest pianists Britain has ever produced. And that might have remained her enduring legacy. Until one February morning in 2007, when Brian Ventura, a financial analyst, was on his way to work. I get off the subway uh, at the corner of Broadway and Wall Street. It was cold, of course, in February, and most people are just walking to work as fast as possible. Listening to classical piano music certainly helps take the mind elsewhere. That morning, Brian had received a new concert artist CD of Joyce Hatto playing Liszt. From the moment I started listening, I knew it was an incredible CD. And yet, when he looked down at the screen, Brian saw something rather puzzling. The name that flashed up as the artist playing was not Joyce Hatto, but a Hungarian pianist called Laszlo Simon. I get this message from somebody named Brian Ventura, who had purchased the Joyce Hatto recording of the Liszt Transcendental Etudes on my recommendation. And I play them both back to back. And what really made me smell a rat was the 10th etude. The C above middle C, I remember, was out of tune in both the Hatto and the Simone recordings. And I thought, hmm. I came into work one morning, and in my inbox was an email from Jed Disler, the title of which was something along the lines of something troubling. Uh, and uh, it certainly was something troubling. Could it be that the Hatto CD was a copy of Laszlo Simons? Inverne hired an audio expert to analyse the two recordings. An hour later, their suspicions were confirmed. Without a shadow of doubt, we were looking at the same piece by the same person, recorded at the same time on the same piano. By day two, a second Hatto CD was found to be plagiarised. Our lawyers told us that we needed three pieces of hard evidence, because one thing could be a mistake or 
just some error in the engineering, the wrong disc got put into a machine, something like that. Two, still could be a mistake. Three, you're starting to see a pattern. To find the third piece of evidence, they picked a work so difficult, it had only ever been recorded by a handful of pianists. Godofsky's Studies on Chopin. And again, bang, 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 they slotted into place. That's when you knew that you were onto something massive and that the whole thing was a scam. Once three CDs had been exposed as frauds, the list of plagiarized pianists escalated. Ian Hobson was an English pianist living in America. Yuki Matsukawa. Carlo Granti. Hisako Hisenki. Polish pianist Eugene Injik. Michael Delberta. Roger Morero. Ingrid Habis. Mark Andre Amala. In February 2007, Hattogate hit the headlines. It really was the most extraordinary scam that I think has ever been perpetrated, certainly in classical music. In total, 92 pianists were found to have been plagiarised. I was a mixture of, oh my God, and no, no, this is, a, this is a mistake. Only one person could explain what had been going on, Mr Barrington Coop himself. So I took a deep breath and I phoned him. I just asked him if he had an explanation and he was um, very friendly, very cool. He said that they weren't fakes. He strongly denied that. They were all 100% Joyce Hatto. He said, if any of your readers can help with any explanations, I'd be very grateful to hear them because I'd like to have this matter cleared up. It was very smooth. To this day, Barry has never given anyone a full answer about what really happened. But now, he seems ready to talk about his role in one of the most audacious frauds the music world has ever seen. Since Joyce Hatto died in 2006, her husband Barry has lived alone in the house they shared for 50 years. As Joyce's sole producer and publicist, Barry devoted his life to her and her music. I wanted people to realise just how wonderful piano music was, and through her, we were able to do it. She had a huge repertoire, huge repertoire. And upstairs is, is boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of music. Um, and she just sat down really and started to, 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 to record it. Although the fraud has been exposed, Barry still says that Joyce herself made the recordings. 
she wanted to record the complete works of Chopin, which she did. She wanted to record the greater works of Mozart. She did all the sonatas and all the other, all the solo works, and Bach. It's the natural gift of the publicist to be able to, um, let's say, put a bit of spin on facts. In the 60s, Barry had a reputation as an unorthodox record producer who operated on the somewhat shadier side of the industry. I think from the word go, he was a bit of a lad, a bit of a chancer. He seemed to have the ability to charmingly push his way in where other people would, would dare to tread from a very early age. He was also a genius sound engineer. I mean, he worked with Joe Meek on this hit record, Telstar, in the 60s. He was very interested and very always adept at using the latest technology. And it was clear that some adept use of technology had been deployed in the creation of the fake Hatto CDs. Not only had they been copied, they'd been skillfully manipulated to disguise their origins. He would slow things down. He would speed things up. You can add reverberation. Boosting the treble or altering the bass. Sometimes he'd swap the channels over, so instead of the left channel coming out of the left speaker, it would come out of the right speaker. Very sophisticated, very clever. When you know that even some of the pianists whose music he stole didn't recognise their own recordings when they were listening to them. Marvellous French-Canadian pianist Marc-André Amelin was played one of the Chopin Godofsky etudes, and he said, that's, it's very good. No, it's not me, it's, but it's a very good performance. He said, well, actually, Mark, it is you. But was it? One of the Hatto CDs that received most acclaim was proven to be taken from a recording by the pianist Paul Kim. Olivier Messiaen's work, Van Regard sur l'Enfant Jésus, represents, for many pianists, myself included, as a quest for the Holy Grail. This recording has part of my spirit in it. I felt violated in being robbed of something that I cherish dearly. In 2007, Barry was investigated by the industry and made to apologize. He made little money from the fraud and was never prosecuted. But many felt he'd got off lightly. The thing which really has left a bitter taste in my mouth is the fact that Barrington Cooper's never made a clean breast. He's never said that he ripped off entire recordings and we know that that's what he's done. A long line of people have already had a go at getting Barry to confess, but with little success. There's a few things I need to ask you. Whether you ever took entire pieces of other pianists and released them as Joyce's recordings? No. No, I didn't. Can you look at me and say for sure that Joyce is playing something on every single CD? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely so, yes. Absolutely so. But Barry has said that he borrowed small sections from other pianists' recordings. And he has a very convincing explanation as to why he did it. In the course of doing these recordings, she would whimper all the way, this awful exclamation of, of pain. She wouldn't stop. And in the end, she didn't know she was doing it. You can't really issue something like a Mozart sonata where the pianist is suddenly, so you'd suddenly hear, oh, oh. And that's the kind of thing that was the sort of thing. It was terribly upsetting. And because the playing was so beautiful, it was so, there was so much music in it, and I just felt it was, I didn't want to, to lose it. And that's how it started. With Joyce no longer around, there is only Barry who knows what really happened in this perplexing tale. And the more people have looked, the more things just don't add up. I looked at the small print and some of the venues seemed impossible to equate with the kind of concertos that apparently were, were sort of recorded in them. I mean, uh, small churches could not accommodate an orchestra for uh, Brahms' second piano concerto. And the garden shed, of course, raised absolute wonders. One thought, well, 
How do you get the London the Royal Philharmonic in a garden shed? Because, of course, there had never been a garden shed. So Joyce did record concertos with an orchestra? Yes. Where? Yes. Of course she, got, of course she did. Where? Well, usually, usually, either we either have done them abroad, of course, and we've done them in Germany, but here, there's, we're fortunate here, there are some beautiful churches, and a lot of them are very quietly out of the way, too. Well, they say that leopards don't change their spots, and I think the Barry, who in the 1950s had been creating conductors called Hans Have a Guess and sopranos called Herder Wobble, was still at it when he was creating a conductor called René Kohler. But René was more than just a made-up name. Barry had gone to the trouble of writing up an entire life story for him. René Kohler, I had a huge one-page biography of him, fantastically detailed about this terrible story of him being you know, tortured by the Nazis, having to leave Germany, and, oh, it was a bit sob story, but René Kohler... Try and find René Kohler in any music dictionary and you will draw a blank. Kohler, I don't know whether you know this, is um, a particularly popular kind of German lavatory pan, and I think, therefore, Barry was having another little joke with everybody. And then there were the orchestras that no-one had ever heard of. I never got an explanation from Barry as to who actually who these orchestras were. Or the reviews Barry quoted that no one could ever source. I couldn't find them anywhere. I couldn't track them down. And Barry's legendary claims about Joyce's adoring public. Six encores. It's almost preposterous, really. It's such a labyrinth. I don't know what's what anymore. One thing is certain. Barry did make his wife into a star. Michelangelo said he looked at a piece of marble, didn't he? And he said, I, I released the figure from the stone. And a good pianist, you choose the sound in your mind and you're totally relaxed and you release the sound from the piano. I think they did it out of love. Simple as that. A mutual desire for them to achieve that place which they both considered was rightfully hers. So it's not two fingers up to the establishment, it's we want to be part of that establishment and we're going to do it. So in the end, did Barry achieve what he'd wanted? I dipped more into the... In, into sin than uh, I really had intended to. Um, but it was only ever used to make, um, make possible an issue of something which was in itself a brilliant performance. You see, I begin to wonder psychologically about this. Does he believe in the whole thing? Does some part of him think this is actually her playing? If you did listen to Joyce Hatto's recordings, you've got, in a sense, the most perfect performances ever made, but you can't listen to them without this other thing in the back of your mind saying, yes, it's been manipulated, it sounds wonderful, it's lovely, but it's manipulated. They're neither the persons who they were stolen from, neither are they Joyce's, they're William Barrington Coop's interpretation of the classics. The satisfaction is that when I die, I do know that I made something, a collection of record, recordings that were as perfect as it's possible for a human to produce. But it wouldn't have been possible at all if Joyce hadn't done them originally. So what do you do with a perfect masterpiece that will always be a fake? <laughs> Ah, oh, that's, a, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, they immediately went into the garage. I tried to sell them on eBay, which is quite funny because eBay refused to sell them because they were plagiarised. So in the end, I put each jewel case and notes up for auction and gave the winning bidder the CD as a free gift. I have what I call my hat box under the piano where all these records of Joyce had us, they might be very valuable one day, might they? <laughs> <laughs>
might send them to South Abyss or something. We still have a stack of Joyce Hattu CDs. Where? Um, in a cardboard box on the shelf. <laughs> in the back room? Yes. Yeah. I did feel like a kind of creator, I suppose, in the same way as Michelangelo. He looked at a piece of stone and all he did was release it from the stone. It's impossible not to have enjoyed doing it. If you enjoyed making something which is pretty well near next to perfect, Thank you.